Well, it was a bit overwhelming, you know, totally unexpected. Um, I was in the midst of watching a high school football game and I looked down and I saw that the papal nuncio had called and suddenly I saw there was a message left. So I went out and checked and gave him a call back and he said that the Holy Father has appointed you the Bishop of Gary. And I knew right away it was Gary, Indiana. And so I said, well, if this is the Holy Father's uh, wishes, I certainly will accept. I said, I'm not worthy, but uh, I'll offer my services. And he said, don't worry about it. And then we began to talk about some logistics. So in an instant, your life has changed. I certainly realized everything would be different. The ordination events were beautiful. I experienced the grace of so many people coming together. Certainly I had some friends who came here from near and far, and then my new family of Gary. So those days uh, were renewing and joy-filled, and it was uh, a time of, of great festivity. That's still continuing. I'm getting out there, meeting my flock, and having a great and joyful time doing it. That gives me a, a sense of learning and understanding. But as I've been going around, I've also been asking people, um, you know, what do you think are some of the, the distinctive uh, strengths of our diocese? And then what are some of those areas that we might need to focus on? I would say I'm blessed that our diocese recently completed a synod under my predecessor, Bishop Hines' leadership. So it's getting to know my new family, listening to their needs, and then looking to the future, building upon what we've had in the past, with a, a clear sense that the Synod has provided us some great anchors to build upon. And I'm sure that as we trust the Holy Spirit, it will become more and more clear. This is a good time for me to learn and then to be able to build. And so I'm excited about that prospect. You know, it's a blast to relate to young people because they're still full of hope. They have a lot of good questions. They don't have the same kind of veneer sometimes that older people can put up. They'll tell you what they're thinking and they can detect authenticity very readily. And so for me, I have found it to be a joy to interact with our young people. I've been blessed to be able to participate and lead a session with a middle school retreat. And for me, what was beautiful about that is to see how the young people do place faith as a priority in their lives. Now, they need to be encouraged and supported and experience the love of Jesus along the way. But I find there's a real openness to be able to do so. At confirmations, you know, I think of it as we receive the Holy Spirit, but as with so many things, uh, we can receive a gift and then it can be left on the shelf. What's significant and what's important is to be able to unwrap the gifts that God has given us, to be able to use what he's entrusted to us through the Holy Spirit. And I find that if young people can make these connections early on, that there is a God, he gave us his son Jesus who loves us, that he calls us to respond to that love, that he sent his Holy Spirit so that we can continue to share his love in the world, that we can have confidence in him. Boy, if you get those things right, you are set on the path. And you know, what we believe is so profound um, you really can't just believe a little of it. You know, I mean, if this is true, there's a God who loves us and he sent his son and he's got a plan for your life, then getting that right makes all the difference. So for myself, certainly raised in the faith, um, I experienced uh, a household of faith. But I did have to, in my high school years and as a young adult, make that further decision to say, okay, I've been raised in this, but do I accept this? Do I believe this? Will I live this out? And the answer to that was a hearty yes. Uh, but when you make those decisions as a youngster, it can set you on a path of happiness and meaning for the rest of your life. God has given us all gifts. But beyond those natural gifts, it's that sense that God created me, he's got a plan for me, and I need to understand what that is, to trust in him. And sometimes we can think like we have to have our act completely together before we can come to God, as if, you know, we're gonna be perfect at the outset. Jesus came because that's not the case. I mean, we're never gonna be perfect. Uh, but when we fall, when we sin, he comes with his mercy. He gives us his compassion. He entrusts us this mission of mercy so that we can be reconciled with him. So uh, younger years can be rocky years, but the years of great growth and this ability to just enliven our relationship with God. It's a penitential season, but I gotta tell you, this is not penance for me to be here tonight. Um, 
this is a great joy. This is, this is like I'm the new kid on the block. I'm learning all the diocese. I'm meeting brother priests and deacons and families, hearing beautiful choirs, and it's just tremendous. We can have prayers of praise. We can have prayers of penitence where we come before the Lord seeking his mercy. But we can also just present to him our needs. So in Lent of 1994 was the Lent that I decided to really discern whether God was calling me to be a priest. I won't tell you the whole story, but because... So I gave up my girlfriend for Lent. That's, that's like what... <laughs> So, um, but anyway, so here's what it came down to is I had to know that God loved me enough that he would work this all out if it was in his will, that he would love me enough to guide me away from the seminary if I wasn't called after I entered, and that he loved me enough that I could just trust him, that I could just say, you're in charge, God. And, and you've got a plan for me. And I don't see it all entirely, but that's okay. Because I know you love me, and I know you know my needs. I came to the point, and I, I just said, I think I'm called to be a priest. But God, I, I know that I'm supposed to enter the seminary. And I thanked him for that. And our prayer really becomes enlivened when we, when we nourish this relationship when we feed, not just kind of here's all, the th here's all the things I want, God, but more than anything else, I know that you love me and that you're taking care of me and that you're going to meet my needs and I can breathe a little easier and I can't see my way out of this yet, but you love me enough that it's going to be okay. I was blessed to be raised in a beautiful Catholic family, and so uh, my parents, Anne and Jim McClory, were great models of the faith for me. And so the faith was never something that was abstract or remote or something, you know, distant from me. I, I found from a very young age that going to church was pretty normal. I was able to go to a Catholic school. And within that, I think a, a confidence that when we pray, God hears us and that God has a plan for us. And so I think that sense of trusting God, that sense of knowing that God um, is in charge and that we can have confidence can really uh, help one to step forward in faith. And so uh, that gift of faith that my parents passed on to me is something that I'm certainly grateful for. Before I entered the seminary of studying public policy with an interest in economic development, and then I went on to law school, so I, I practiced law for a few years. Of course, then I entered the seminary. Some people could say, well, that's such a, a radical shift. You know, here you've been practicing law, and now you want to become a priest. Uh, but for me, I do see God's hand in the midst of that. I look back, and I can see that the Lord has used all the parts of my background to help serve uh, in the way that he's called me. So more specifically, I hope that at least some sensitivity to these issues as we uh, grapple with challenges that we have in Northwest Indiana would, would come to the fore. I'm not uh, currently you know, a public policy analyst, but I do take an active interest in those. And in particular, just seeing the role that uh, communities of faith can have in renewing communities, that those places where you see among the most vibrant renewal of faith, is it's not, purely an economic revival, but usually it starts with a, a renewal of hope, a renewal of confidence that there is a plan. My role as a pastoral leader is to be able to encourage those who are working hard uh, to know that God is with them, uh, that he has a plan, and that he has hope for our region. The Holy Spirit's in charge of it all, so I need to make sure that I'm praying to the Holy Spirit, that I have wisdom and guidance as I go forward, as we go forward as the people of Northwest Indiana to be able to serve and to love God's people. So I hope I'll have a listening ear, someone who can hear the concerns of people, hear their needs, an ability to, to connect people, to, to bring people together, um, rooted in the love that Jesus gives to us. So uh, whatever talents I have, I want to give them to the disposal of God. Before I came here, uh, I was pastor of two different parishes in sequence.
One of them was a small, uh, predominantly African-American parish in the city of Detroit. And the love and the passion in that very intimate group, small in size, but potent spiritually, was a beautiful place to experience the love of God. I went from there, in the midst of some diocesan responsibilities I had as well, uh, to pastoring really one of the largest parishes. But what I found is the same skills uh, that I tried to use in a smaller parish setting were ones that extended themselves to an even larger parish. Here I am now in Northwest Indiana, and I have to tell you that the thing that I'm really grateful for is that the people of God are very warm in their embrace. Uh, as a pastor, you know, you're, you're directly involved with your flock on, on a really daily basis. We're much larger here. The reality of that personal engagement, even in the midst of some limitations with the pandemic and so on, uh, is still the hallmark of leading. Among the things that I've learned is that we have a beautiful diocese with really loving members of the faithful. And I came here at a unique time. You know, we had just concluded a diocesan synod, which is a remarkable accomplishment. Those themes that the synod addressed, particularly the overarching theme, are ones that I still embrace. What's the overarching theme? Go make disciples. And really that message, go make disciples, is consistent with what Pope Francis said to me through the papal nuncio at my very ordination, which was that the Holy Father is counting on me to lead the people of the Diocese of Gary to be both disciples and missionaries. So what does this mean, discipleship, being a missionary? It really means that our identity is rooted in Jesus. Our strength comes from all that he's given us through the Catholic Church to be able to be nourished to be able to receive the sacraments, which is a, a huge part of our life as Catholics. And that it's not just a, a Sunday experience, you know, it's not just like, okay, I gotta go to mass and I'll check that box in the week. But to be a disciple means that your whole identity finds its joy, its meaning, its purpose, and the fact that we're beloved sons and daughters of God. So to be a missionary for a family might mean that their mission territory is their family. You know, kind of raising holy kids, God bless you, that's your mission field. But for many of us, it will extend beyond the family. For some people, it will take a more active expression in works of service and charity and love. We wanna meet the needs of our community. You know, those are material needs as well as spiritual needs. But to then really reflect, if we're disciples, if we really believe all this is true, that Jesus loves us, that he's got a plan for us, then that is part of our identity to share it with others. In the midst of the pandemic, there certainly have been some restrictions and limitations. And while I want to focus on what we can do, and I'm very proud of all that we have done, right now it's prudent for us to wear masks. I get it, I'm doing it, we should all do it. Uh, what I'm looking forward to is a deeper return of the members of the faithful to our churches. Obviously, for safety reasons, some people have absented themselves because it's what they have to do for their own well-being and the well-being of others. However, I'm so proud that our parishes have worked diligently to ensure that we have cleaning protocols, that we're ensuring proper mask wearing and social distancing. It's a little different, but I'm proud that we've made all the sacraments accessible during this time because that's who we are in the life of the church, which for us as Catholics means we're coming together, we're with each other. I'm a people person, so I mean, I'm like a fish fry Catholic, you know, I'm a parish picnic kind of Catholic. And so uh, I acknowledge that a lot of those activities have been modified, if not eliminated. And so that's prudent and we need to make adaptations. Uh, but just on a very human level, um, I am looking forward to the time when we can just enjoy those social experiences together. Uh, certainly I've tried to extend myself to the people of the Diocese of Gary. So I've been able to meet the people and the people have been able to meet me, but that kind of family celebration, that family of faith, uh, I look forward to doing that with even greater intensity uh, and joy when we can all come together. When I came here, uh, which was beginning of February 2020, uh, the people of the Diocese of Gary gave me a warm and loving embrace. And I want them to know that I'm so grateful for that, that I love our flock, um, that I lift you up in prayer every single day, uh, that my heart longs for you to be happy, healthy, and holy. And so I wanna be uh, a part of that. 
You know, I, I reflect on, we had this jam-packed cathedral, you know. I mean, it was standing room only, you know, sold out. I mean, it didn't cost anything. But they were, you know, we were just full and, and vibrant. And so I look forward to those days. Uh, I look forward to being together as a family. In the meantime, we gotta be patient. We'll work our way through this. I have every confidence that the Lord has a plan for us. And so I look forward to the future with hope. I think we're all gonna need to learn from this. We're all gonna need to grow from this. But really, my hope is that as we look to the future, we will be that family of faith and the family will spread our arms to invite others in. I love being the Bishop of Gary. It's been a wild ride, but it's been a great ride and there's way more to come. So I am delighted to be here and uh, excited to what the future holds.